This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 24, Into the Forest, Part 2. We left off last time with the Pandavas having assembled a traveling party of Brahmins and then settled down in northwestern India along the banks of the Sarasvati River. With Damya's guidance, Yudhishthira had managed to summon the sun god and won from him the ability to produce food for himself and all his followers. Meanwhile, back in Hastinapur, Duryodhana and his father the king were beginning to panic at the prospect of what they had set in motion. Not long after settling in the forest, the Pandava's uncle Vidur suddenly appeared. While he might be their dear and sympathetic uncle, he was also the king's man, so imagine their consternation when he arrived at their camp. Yudhishthira asked Bhima, What do you think the steward is up to? Is he coming to summon me to another dice game? You know that once challenged, I am unable to refuse. Then the five brothers stood up and greeted their uncle with due respect. Vidor quickly dispelled their fears. He had not come on the king's business. In fact, the king had thrown him out. It turned out that King Dhritarashtra was no happier after their exile than before and had turned to his younger brother for comfort. Vidor immediately set to accusing the king of acting in bad faith and advising that he should send Duryodhana out to the forest and take back the Pandavas. This was not what the king wanted to hear. And, getting no sympathy from his brother, he got irate. Dhritarashtra accused Vidor of being more loyal to his nephews than he was to the king. The king sent Vidor away, saying, Go where your confidence lies. No more do I want you as my companion. And so, Vidor packed up his chariot and headed out to the Kanyaka forest to join his nephews. After explaining to the Pandavas why he'd shown up here, Vidor then broke out into one of his preachy lectures on Dharma. He said, When you are oppressed by your rivals, exert your patience and bide your time. The self-possessed man will rule the earth. If you share your wealth with your helpers, your helpers will also share in distress. This is how you hold on to your helpers, and with them you will conquer the world. Finally, Vidor said, Tell the truth without complaint. Share food equally with your companions, and do not put yourself before others. This is how a king prospers. In contrast to his uncle, Yudhishthira warmly welcomed his uncle's moralizing. He said, I shall do as you counsel me, Vidor, and will thoughtfully practice your great wisdom. Thus, Vidor joined his nephews in their humble camp in the woods. Not long after, Dhritarashtra began missing his brother. His mind spinning with inner conflict, he even passed out in open court in front of all the kings and lords. His loyal charioteer Sanjay rushed to his aid, and when the king regained consciousness, he told Sanjay, My brother and friend is like the god of Dharma incarnate. As I remember him now, my heart is torn apart. Bring him back to me at once. Sanjay readily agreed that it was time to bring back the steward. He jumped on his chariot and rode out to Kanyaka Forest. As he approached Yudhishthira's camp, he saw Yudhishthira, clothed in deer skins, sitting with Vidur, surrounded by his brothers and thousands of Brahmins. After greeting each of them according to their status, Sanjay addressed Vidur and told him that his brother the king begged him to return to Hastinapur. Once again, Vidur jumped onto his chariot and rode back with Sanjay to Hastinapur. The blind king embraced his brother and begged Vidur's forgiveness. The news of Dhritarashtra's reconciliation with Vidur quickly made its way to Duryodhana and his cronies. Duryodhana complained that Vidur was his enemy and would poison the mind of his father. Working himself into a temper tantrum, Duryodhana turned to his counselors and demanded that they advise him in some way to neutralize Vidur's influence with the king. He said, Counsel me to my benefit so that Vidur does not reverse the king's mind and bring the Pandavas back. If I see my cousins somehow return here, I shall take poison, or the noose, or the sword, because I cannot bear to see them here and rich again. Exasperated, Shakuni scolded his nephew. You are a king, a lord of your people, yet you give in to these childish thoughts. The Pandavas made an agreement and they left. They will not return. The Pandavas live by the truth of their oaths. They would never accept the king's invitation. My advice is that we hang back for now and watch for weakness with the Pandavas. The toady Dushasan readily agreed with his uncle. Karna too endorsed Shakuni's advice. Having consensus among his advisors, Duryodhana accepted their words, but not too happily. Karna was very sensitive to his friend's moods and gestures, and the look Duryodhana gave him stirred on his loyalty. Karna turned angrily on Shakuni and Dushasan and declared, We all want to do anything we can to please our prince, but none of us will stay in his favor if we do not act now. So let's don our armor, mount our chariots, and kill these Pandavas right now while they are weak. This was just what Duryodhana wanted to hear, so everybody gave a cheer and prepared to make war on their defenseless cousins. 
Clearly, at this point, the plot of the story was in real danger of spinning out of control. The half-naked Pandavas were defenseless and exposed in the jungle, while an armored contingent rumbled across the plains set on their destruction. Who could save them now? It was time for the author of the story to intervene. Sage Vyasa was instantly aware of what was about to happen, and he appeared before the war party and halted it. Vyasa simply ordered them to desist, and they just turned around and went home. Vyasa then went to the king's court to talk to the errant prince's father. This was Vyasa's first opportunity to express what he thought of the whole dice affair, and he really laid into the king. He said, It does not please me that the Pandavas were cheated and sent to the forest, king. In thirteen years they will remember all of this and will bring terrible vengeance. If your feeble-minded son tries to kill them in the forest, he will only lose his own life. War with your own relatives is lawless infamy. My advice to you is to send your own son to the forest and live with the Pandavas, alone and without his cronies. Then perhaps some love will spring up in him for the Pandavas, and you might succeed in saving his life. King Dhritarashtra repentantly agreed with Vyasa's analysis and told him he had already received similar advice from Vidur, Drona, Kripa, and Bhishma. Knowing his own weakness, the king begged Vyasa to go to Dhirodhana and try to set him straight. I guess Vyasa had done enough meddling in his own story already, because just that I guess Vyasa had done enough meddling in his own story already, because just then another sage named Maitreya arrived in Hastinapur. Rather than going in person and talking to Yodhana, Vyasa told the king, Here comes the blessed seer Maitreya, just arrived from staying with the Pandavas. This great seer shall lecture your son, and whatever he says, I suggest you carry it out assiduously, because if you do not heed him, he will surely lay a curse on you. Vyasa then departed, and on his heels came the sage Maitreya. The king greeted the sage with all due respect and asked him what news from his travels. The sage said, While touring the pilgrimage sites, I came across Yudhishthira in the forest. There were crowds of holy men all come to see this great spirited man. While there, I was told about your son's wicked behavior at the dice match. I have always loved the Kurus, and so I have made my way to you. The grumpy old sadhu then lectured the king, telling him that he was to blame for the strife among his heirs. At some point during this scene, Duryodhana himself showed up to greet the sage. He was not pleased at what Maitreya had to say. The sage turned to Duryodhana and said, Lord Duryodhana, for your own good, do not offend the Pandavas. They are valiant warriors, are sworn to the truth, and are killers of God's foes. Maitreya then listed some of the Pandavas' more impressive feats, such as killing Jarasand, defeating the famous Rakshasas Hidimba, Baka, and even the ferocious ogre named Kirmira. Duryodhana only smirked at his cronies, slapped his thigh, and made pictures in the sand. When Maitreya noticed that the boy wasn't taking him seriously, he exploded in rage. Maitreya touched water and cursed him. Because you ignore me and will not obey me, you shall soon reap the reward of your insolence. Through your offense, a great war will flare up, and during that war, Bhima will smash your thigh with his club. Dhritarashtra pleaded with Maitreya to revoke his curse, but the sage replied, If your son seeks peace, then the curse will not take effect. It is up to him. The court went silent in contemplation of their fate. Finally, King Dhritarashtra broke the silence with the curious question. You said Bhima killed Kirmira? How did he manage that? I'll leave it until next episode to tell you the story of Bhima and Kirmira. I find it interesting how in this story, they trade out one sage for another in the middle of the plot line. The story starts with Vyasa stopping Karna's raid, but then he leaves in the middle to be replaced by the more obscure sage Maitreya. Thus it is Maitreya who loses his temper and curses Duryodhana. One purpose of the story appears to be further justification for Bhima much later in the story, when he somewhat unfairly strikes Duryodhana below the belt. I know there are apologists for Duryodhana out there, and they like to point to that final battle as evidence of the Pandava's infamy. Now we can excuse Bhima and point to Maitreya as the cause for Bhima's unfair blow. That's all for now. Next time, we'll follow Bhima's ogre-killing exploits, a visit from the Pandava's allies, and Arjun's journey into the Himalayas. Thanks for listening.